In this video, I'm going to talk about the different kinds of context-free languages. In particular, I'm going to talk about ambiguous languages, and I'll also talk about LLK languages, LRK languages, and some other classes of languages, and describe how the different kinds of context-free languages relate to each other and how they relate to other classes of languages that are not context-free. Here's an example context-free language. Well, it's a context-free grammar, so we're, we're talking about the language that this grammar defines. This is an, a language for expressions using plus, multiplication, parentheses, and we're not too concerned about uh, the uh, things that we are relating in these uh, expressions, and so we'll just have a terminal called A. So we can generate things like A plus A times A. Now, in uh, uh, arithmetic class, uh, when you were younger, you learned uh, that uh, the multiplication should have precedence over the addition and that you should do the multiplication operation first and then do the addition. But with this grammar, notice that this particular expression, shall we say, this, this particular string in the language uh, has two different parse trees. Okay, Here's the first one. We chose to expand the starting symbol using the second rule first, e goes to e times e, and then we expanded the first e with the first rule e goes to e plus e. That yields a perfectly legitimate parse tree for a plus a times a. Over here we have a different parse tree for the same string, a plus a times a, but in this case we used the first rule first, e goes to e plus e. And then we expanded the second e using the second rule, e goes to e times e. So we see two different parse trees for the same string of terminals. Now for every parse tree, there's exactly one leftmost derivation. So there's a leftmost derivation for this string using this parse tree, and there's a leftmost derivation that's different for this side over here. And likewise, there's also a rightmost derivation corresponding to, to this parse tree, and there's a rightmost derivation corresponding to that parse tree. So an ambiguous string is a, a string such as this one that has more than one parse tree. So there are fundamentally different ways to derive this string in the grammar, and you can see in this example that these fundamentally different ways correspond to whether we do the addition first and then perform the multiplication, or whether we perform the multiplication first and then do the addition. So these are fundamentally different interpretations of this string using this grammar. So that's an ambiguous string, more than one parse tree, or to say it another way, any string that has more than one leftmost derivation is ambiguous or to say it another way, any string that has more than one rightmost derivation is ambiguous. An ambiguous grammar is, a, is one in which at least one string can be derived in more than one way. In other words, a, an ambiguous grammar is a grammar where some string has multiple parse trees. If it contains, if this grammar can generate ambiguous strings, then the grammar itself is ambiguous. Just because the grammar is ambiguous doesn't mean that there's not an equivalent unambiguous grammar that describes the same language. And this example shows that. Here is our grammar from before. It is ambiguous as we showed. And here is another grammar, and I will just tell you that it is equivalent. What does equivalent mean? It means it generates the same language. And furthermore, it is unambiguous. It's a little bit harder to understand this grammar, and this is the topic of compiler classes, uh, but E goes to E plus T. This is expressions being broken down into T stands for terms and F stands for factors. So this is a, an E is a string of something plus something plus, some, a string of T strung together with plus signs. T plus T plus T plus T. And T's are strings of F's strung together with the time sign, F times F times F times F. And factors are paren 
E per N. And then we have a rule for uh, the factor can also be the terminal A. So this grammar is unambiguous and it generates the same language. So it shows us that just because the grammar is ambiguous doesn't mean there is not an unambiguous grammar. The unambiguous grammar for that language may be difficult to find if it exists, but it may exist. The topic of compiler class um, and, and, and writing compilers and designing grammars for computer languages is really uh, to come up with unambiguous grammars. This grammar may be easier to understand for expressions, but when it comes to a compiler and a compiler interpreting a particular program, you'd like the interpretation to be completely unambiguous. And that's why the second grammar would be more preferable uh, to be used in a programming language. This one might be uh, easier to describe in loose terms what an expression is going to look like, but you need additional rules to say that the multiplication should be grouped more tightly than the addition. This grammar is designed so that the parse trees will always group the multiplication more tightly than the addition unless parentheses are used to override that. Now I mentioned elsewhere that every regular language is context free and here I want to talk a little bit more about that. To say it again, every regular language is context free but the subset relationship is a proper relationship. In other words, there are some languages that are not regular but that are context free. The set of context free languages is, is greater than the set of regular languages. So if we've got a regular language then by definition there must be a finite state automaton for that language. So given a deterministic finite state automaton for the language, which we know must exist if it's regular, then I'm going to show you in this slide how to construct an equivalent context-free grammar for that language. That proves that the regular language is context-free because if a context-free grammar for the language exists, then the language is context-free itself. So here's a sample, an example uh, deterministic finite state machine. The terminal symbols are 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you've got some states A, B, C, and D. Starting state, and in this case we've only got one accepting state. So here's how I, you can make a context-free grammar to accept this language. Make a non-terminal for each state. So our set of non-terminals will be A, B, C, and D. Then make the non-terminal for the starting state, A that is, be the starting state, the starting non-terminal for the grammar. So our grammar is going to start with A. That's our starting symbol. Then for each rule, go ahead and make one, sorry, for each edge in the, in the deterministic uh, finite state machine, make one rule in the grammar. So for this edge, there will be a rule added to the grammar. For this edge, a rule. For that edge, a rule, and so on. And then add an epsilon edge for every accept state. So here's what we're going to have. For A going to B on 1, we add the rule A goes to 1B. For the edge A goes to C on 3, we have a rule A goes to 3C. B goes to itself on 2, so we see that right here. And finally, the accepting state, D goes to epsilon. And you can imagine a parse tree for any string generated by this language is going to look like a long string of non-terminals with terminal, 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 terminal on the side until finally it goes to epsilon. So it's very much matching the linear nature of the regular uh, language and its finite state machine. Now we're going to look at what I call the language onion, which is the set-subset relationship between the different kinds of languages. I know this is a bit hard to read, so I'm going to read it off. Um, first of all, each one of these bubbles is a set. So this is a Venn diagram, essentially and it's showing that the inner bubbles are representing sets that are proper subsets of the larger bubbles. 
So all of these are proper subset relationships as well. Uh, let's start down at the bottom and we see that this is the set of all regular languages. Since a language is a set of strings, perhaps I should call it the class of all regular languages. Class is a synonym for set. A language is a set, so I'm talking about the set of all sets. Okay, so the class of all regular languages we, is a simple class of languages, and it's uh, described uh, by regular expressions and by deterministic finite state machines and by non-deterministic finite state machines. They all have equivalent power. Then uh, I want to talk about this bubble here, which is the context-free languages. Okay, And uh, elsewhere I'll talk about uh, how to accept uh, a string with a push-down automaton, but the machine that w corresponds to regular expressions is a finite state machine, and the machine that corresponds to context-free languages is a non-deterministic push-down automaton. It's a proper subset. All regular languages are included in the context-free language category, but there are others that aren't. Now, there are several different kinds of context-free languages that we can talk about that are interesting. And these are, in some sense, determined by how we parse them. So here I have LLK languages. Here I have LRK languages. So the LLK languages are parsed by predictive parsers. These are top-down parsers. These are uh, uh, languages that are f fairly simple uh, and uh, easy to parse. They're quick and easy to parse uh, with a top-down parser, or sometimes the top-down parsers are called predictive parsers. Then you have the class called LL. Sorry, you have the class called LRK languages, and these correspond to um, languages that can be accepted by a deterministic push-down automaton. And this category of languages includes a lot of programming languages, such as uh, C or C++ or Java. The parsing algorithms for these languages are more complex. And uh, uh, then above that, you have unambiguous languages. So this is the set of all languages that are unambiguous. And then finally, you have all context-free languages. So there are some languages that are context-free that are ambiguous. Okay, now where do the context-free languages live uh, in relationship to uh, larger categories of languages? Here we have decidable languages. Here we have Turing-recognizable languages. And here we have all languages. The machine that corresponds to these categories up here is the Turing machine. And elsewhere I'll talk about Turing machines. But basically a Turing machine is like a computer and running a program. And the program, uh, for some programs will always halt and are guaranteed to halt. If the Turing machine will always halt when it is given a particular sample string for the language, then the language is decidable. In other words, this is a language that can be decided by a computer program such that if the string is in the language, the computer program will run, halt, and say yes. And if the, lang if the string is not in the language, the computer program will run, halt, and say no. That's the class of decidable languages. It's a proper subset, uh, sorry, a proper superset of context-free languages. And then we have the Turing recognizable languages. This, languages in this category can be recognized. Okay, so for example, um, if we're given a string and it is in the language, the Turing machine will halt and say, yes, that string is in the language. But if we provide a string that's not in the language, the Turing machine may not ever halt. So we can determine whether things are in the language, but we have trouble determining when they're not in the language. It's, a much, uh, it's an even more complex class of languages. And then finally, we have the class of all languages. And in these case, in, f for such a language, when we're given an example string, we can't tell whether it's in the language or not. We cannot write a program to determine that. So these things are very interesting and uh, somewhat uh, more abstract. Uh, this is also sort of a chart of abstractness. Regular languages seem con concrete and 
relatively easy to understand. And as you go up this hierarchy to more complex languages, LLK, LRK, unambiguous languages, ambiguous context-free languages, decidable languages, Turing-recognizable languages, and then the set of all languages, you get more and more complex. And it gets, frankly, a little bit more difficult to understand, but also much more interesting as you get uh, to the outer layers of the onion.